Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'll introduce myself really quickly and then we'll move on to who really matters here today. Uh, my name is Fernanda. I'm a, an associate with the antitrust and competition and compliance investigations teams in Verano. Uh, this webinar is to discuss the recent developments in merger control in both the US and Brazil and the possible impacts in transactions in the near future. So under the Biden administration, the US antitrust agencies have adopted a more rigorous approach, including regarding some transactions that would not ordinarily face strong difficulties in the past. Although in Brazil, a changing is not directly associated with a change in administration, significant changes in Cadiz tribunal composition are expected to occur later this year, which may impact important aspects of the antitrust case law in the country. So what we plan to discuss today is the recent actions by the U.S. Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission, changes in Brazil, ACAGE, proposed changes to merger guidelines in the U.S. and in Brazil, proposed changes to hard scarbardino reporting requirements in the U.S., and a comparison of the merger reporting requirements in Brazil and the U.S. So to discuss these changes, including the proposed changes to merger, merger reporting requirements and the draft guidelines recent, uh, recently, recently published by the DOJ and the FTC in the U.S., as well as those submitted to public consultation by CADI in Brazil, I'd like to introduce our speakers from Stepto Partners, Michael Weiner, who has significant experience advising clients across the spectrum of antitrust matters, focusing on merger reviews and litigation, resolving government investigations, effectively litigating antitrust issues across a broad range of industries, and providing strategic counseling and compliance advice. Lee Berger, who focuses on antitrust law, including civil enforcement, private litigation, criminal investigations, compliance and advice, and mergers. And before joining STEPTO, Lee served as the inaugural chief of the Civil Conduct Task Force, Antitrust Trust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. And John Kavanaugh, who focuses on complex litigation, including antitrust, securities matter, government investigations, and criminal defense matters, as well as insurance coverage and reinsurance disputes, having litigated numerous cases involving antitrust, contract, fraud, unfair trade practice, RICO, and trade secret matters. From Verano, partners Leonardo Manila Duarte, who is a partner with the Antitrust and Competition Team, Enrico Romaniello, who is a part with the partner with the Antitrust and Competition and Regulatory Teams, and Alberto Monteiro, who is a partner with the Antitrust and Competition and Compliance and Investigations Teams. So our speakers will go through the presentation and we will have some time at the end for a Q&A section. So we do encourage questions after the presentation. So to start things off, uh, Lee, I think everyone is interested to know how the Biden administration has differed from past U.S. and presidential administrations regarding antitrust merger review. Thank you, Fernanda. Uh, the new Biden administration, which came into uh, power in 2021, uh, has really marked a new direction in antitrust uh, merger review in the United States. And the shift in antitrust enforcement has been both progressive and aggressive. It's been progressive because it's been uh, a very left-leaning administration when it comes to uh, antitrust enforcement. Usually between administrations, Republican, Democrat, there's some shift in how uh, antitrust enforcement is treated. Uh, Democrats tend to be more aggressive against businesses. Republicans may be a little friendlier toward business, but the shift is very uh, small. Um, the administration today has become very progressive, uh, even throwing away, to a certain extent, the consumer welfare standard, which has been used to enforce uh, merger review and antitrust uh, conduct investigations for decades, uh, and instead is looking to a number of other areas to support antitrust uh, investigations, inc including equity issues uh, and labor issues. Uh, there's also been a really uh, aggressive Stance by both uh, the FTC and the DOJ, where uh, there's a no holds barred approach to litigation. Uh, the focus of the administration has been uh, definitely big tech companies uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and um, Google, Apple. Oh, and Apple. Apple. <laughs> and thank you, and Apple, uh, and uh, to, with, a, with a minor in, uh, in Microsoft now. Uh, but the um, 
the tech companies are not the only target of the administration. Also, big agricultural companies are a focus of the administration, as are private equity firms. Uh, there is a investigative philosophy that is different than prior administrations. Prior administrations would only litigate when they believed they had a good chance of winning. Uh, today, the DOJ and FTC's philosophy is that they litigate everything. They're not afraid to lose. They don't want to settle. Uh, and uh, their philosophy is, if we don't stand up for uh, the little guy against antitrust violations, nobody will. And so even if they're, it's likely they're going to lose, uh, the DOJ will still litigate. Because making that point, making the... Uh, uh, the stand on what antitrust law should be, it's more important than, than the actual victory. Uh, next slide, please. So how does this come out specifically in a uh, merger review? So I, we can see that over the past 12 months, 90% of significant merger investigations have resulted in either a complaint against the companies or abandonment. That is a very, very high level. That means that uh, from uh, every second request, almost all second requests have ended in either DOJ or FTC suing or uh, the deal falling apart. And uh, it's that is much, much higher than normal. Often, uh, including when I was at the DOJ in the last administration, uh, the uh, half the time that you'd have a second request or more, uh, the second request would end with uh, allowing the deal to go through. DOJ or FTC got more information, and then the deal goes through. No longer. Um, also, the investigations are lasting much longer. Uh, many investigations are open, and yet they uh, just drag on and they don't close. However, uh, this approach of litigating everything has resulted in a surprisingly high loss rate. Certainly, DOJ and FTC lost cases before, but usually they would only bring cases if they thought they could win. Uh, in the last six cases that the DOJ and FTC have brought, they've only won two of them uh, for merger litigations. And that is really a remarkably bad streak. And I think that that is the direct result of being willing to bring cases even if you can't win them. Uh, so I think that the, the sum total of this is going to be that that threat of extensive review, the threat of um, litigating no matter what is going to chill uh, mergers. Next slide, please. So the DOJ and FTC have uh, now set forth a policy that they will not settle uh, merger investigations. Uh, if the company does a fix it first, before they file, they uh, address whatever the antitrust problem is, uh, then that's fine and the DOJ will, so oh, sell, uh, will sign off on it, even if there's um, might have been an antitrust problem, but for the fix. But if the DOJ opens an investigation, it's now too late. Uh, where in earlier administrations, you could start have an investigation open, work with the DOJ, negotiate with the FTC, and get a deal to let your deal, uh, let your transaction through, uh, no longer. Uh, and this came to a head in the Asa Abloy trial, which regarded the industry of door locks, where Asa Abloy filed their HSR. They told the DOJ, as they would in the old days, um, let's uh, we'll, we'll get, we'll sell off some of our assets. We'll do a divestiture and we'll take care of the problem. DOJ said no, and they had to litigate that fix. But the court said, I don't understand why we're here. Uh, As Abloy is willing to address this, and so what is this litigation about? And forced the uh, forced the DOJ and As Abloy into negotiations, uh, which ultimately ended in a consent decree. Um, but that. That is the only instance in which there's been a consent decree from the DOJ recently, and now the FTC has adopted the same policy. So the recommendation is before you enter into a transaction and make a filing in the United States, that you try to fix any potential antitrust problems because you might not get a chance to do so after you file. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Enrico, with regard to CADE, do you believe that changes may lead to higher scrutiny on the antitrust merger review in Brazil? Hi, Fernanda. Good morning. Thank you for the question. And uh, good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to have you uh, in our webinar to discuss uh, major issues in merger control rules and enforcement in Brazil and in the U.S. 
I, I believe there's a there, there's somewhat of a difference between the Brazil and the U.S. in terms of uh, the, the, the the shifting pendulum be, uh, between a higher enforcement rate and lower enforcement regarding merger control. I think this is much more visible in the U.S. than in Brazil. Uh, but we do have some major changes in Kaji happening, already happened, and expected to happen within two weeks uh, that will possibly cause major changes, much more than a change in administration uh, level. So here we have a slide comparing last, the, the, the latest Kaji's composition uh, in the tribunal and in the gen general superintendents. As we all know, Kaji is mainly composed by a tribunal with seven, six commissioners and one president and a general superintendent with uh, one uh, general superintendent, two deputy general superintendents, and 11 units. Within Kaji, uh, as tribunal, uh, last week, or last couple of weeks, we already had three commissioners leaving office, which were Commissioner Hoffman, Commissioner Havaniani, and Commissioner Prado. I think we can move this slide, Fernanda, please. So this is the current composition within Kaji's tribunal. We do have four of them left. But as of a couple of weeks from now, Commissioner Bridal will also leave office in November 4th, which will leave us with only three members, Commissioner Vitor, Commissioner Gustavo, and President Cordeiro. Uh, this will bring us some challenges. This already happened last, last time this happened was 2019. And this, will, this brings a lot of challenges and opportunities for uh, antitrust enforcement. I think we can move up to the next slide. The first challenge and the potential implication for uh, this mess is the, 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 the end of the, the, the terms of four commissioners is the potential lack of minimum quorum in the tribunal. As of the, our antitrust law and our antitrust uh, regulation, uh, there's a minimum of four members within Kaji's tribunal to, held, to hold uh, judging sessions in the tribunal. If this minimum quorum is not satisfied, is not present, all deadlines within Kaji are suspended, which means that transactions that require Kaji's approval cannot be closed until the quorum is reestablished. As we all know, the, 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 the majority of cases of merger control within Kaji are approved by the general superintendents. But once approved, we do have a 15-day waiting period, which is a waiting period for third parties or the tribunal to challenge that approval. If the tribunal does not have a minimum quorum, this specific deadline is suspended and transactions cannot be closed. Actually, today was the last day for uh, transactions that were under review by Kaji uh, that needed to be approved in order for the deadline of November 4th to be uh, completed at 15 day waiting period. So we do have this potential implication, which is a major issue uh, here in Brazil. But we do have some opportunities as well. Uh, we may have a new majority within Kaji's tribunal in significant aspects, because we do have four new commissioners coming soon, uh, which may form a new majority in aspects such as uh, assessment of uh, complex merger cases, definition of fines and investigations of anti-competitive conduct, and so on and so forth. This may, uh, this may impose some challenges as well in terms of continuation of case law within CAD. And uh, another opportunity for us is stronger women representation within the tribunal. As we saw, we only had one commissioner in the last uh, CAD's tribunal compos composition. Now we have four for leaving, hopefully we will have a, a stronger female representation uh, within Kaji, uh, within Kaji's commissioner uh, soon. There are no uh, concrete uh, news about who is coming, uh, but hopefully the, the nominations will be based on technical criteria and uh, Kaji will be able to continue to do this uh, job of excellency. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. And here uh, we, 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 we we prepared this, this chart just to see that although there were significant changes in Kaji's composition within, these, within this period from 2017 to 2022, we do not see a clear correlation between new compositions and a stronger or a higher pattern for merger control. 
the majority of cases, the high majority of cases, are still approved without any restrictions, which is the blue line. Uh, and only a few cases are uh, approved with restrictions, and fewer cases are rejected. In, from 2019 to 2021, we did not have any case rejected. In 2022, we had one. And uh, so this trend, this, we can see a, a very clear trend that does not move significantly within the, the, the cases approved with restrictions and rejected. The cases approved with, without restrictions just shows a, a higher uh, number of cases being filed within CAD as of 2020, 2020. I think we can move on to the next slide, Fernando. Uh, so I, I don't think that CAD has been adopting a more aggressive approach in terms of merger control. So I don't think the data shows that. The great majority of cases are still approved within a month through the fast track procedure in 2022, uh, almost 90% of the cases were approved within a month. Uh, of course, there are more complex cases, which will uh, require further time of analysis by CAD, which uh, involves a long finding questionnaire, uh, involves intense scrutiny for, uh, for the transaction, for, for which we also recommend uh, discussing with the authority first beforehand, discussing remedies, uh, Kaji, including, has um, uh, a remedy gu guideline establishing what what are the, the boundaries and what are the recommendation for fixed first remedies. So uh, there, there are a lot of uh, precautionary measures parties need to take before finding a very complex case within Kaji. One of them, for instance, is regarding exchange of information and negotiations to avoid gun jumping discussions and also uh, to, to, to establish remedies to uh, avoid discussions on the merits regarding the exchange of sensitive information. CAD had recently uh, some cases in which this was particularly troublesome, was approved by the general superintendents and CAD tribunal requested to, to review again. And this was the major issue in these cases, the exchange of sensitive information among competitors and the existence of um, effective governance measures to avoid it. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that's it for my contribution. I'm uh, available for potential questions here. Thank you, Enrico. Uh, Michael, under the proposed new merger guidelines, what changes are in store for US merger activity? Um, thanks, Fernanda. It's a very good question. And the short answer is a lot, um, which I'll hope to explain in the next, next few minutes. So proposed new merger guidelines were released on July 19th. <clears throat> the comment period ended in the middle of September. There are three public workshops, hearings. One was held on September 5th. The second one was held a week or two ago. It didn't make it to the slide, but it was still held. And when will they go into effect? Well, they're sort of in effect now because they do represent the, the philosophy of this Department of Justice. They won't really be in effect um, and used uh, in litigation. They'll probably, my, my fearless prediction is the end of the first quarter. Uh, they received thousands of comments uh, they need to work through those comments, but the FTC and DOJ have to agree on the response to those comments. Um, and the conclusion, yeah, much stiffened enforcement philosophy. Let me give you a little bit of, of, of history here. In the uh, 1960s and 70s, the case law on merger control was very rigorous. Um, deals were, were presumptively unlawful based on very small increases in market share. Um, Ronald Reagan got elected president in 1980, and with him, he brought the uh, Chicago Revolution in antitrust, and uh, the DOJ and FTC began to, to uh, enforce the law as they thought it should be. Uh, they, they put in their own thinking, their own economic philosophy of what was bad and what was good. Uh, bigness was not necessarily bad in, in their eyes. And as a practitioner trying to defend a merger, you really knew that you needed to win it at the agencies, because if you could persuade them then you were fine. But if you didn't and you went to court, those same uh, Chicago school enforcers would be relying on the 1960s and 70s case law that uh, that, that was very rigorous. Uh, now, we still have enforcement philosophy reflected by the agencies, but the agencies are taking the point of view that they're in the law enforcement business, not in the legislation business, not in the, in the business of creating what the economic standards should be, but they're enforcing the law as it's written and as it's been interpreted by the courts it, so we're going back to the 1960s and 70s uh, case law, and for the first time, the new merger guidelines cite the, that, that case law in, in, uh, in each of the guidelines. So 
conclusion much stiffer than enforcement philosophy, really going back to, to where the uh, Whitwood case is said. Um, next slide, uh, Fernanda. So one of the headlines from this is they've changed the structural presumption standard under the 2010 horizontal merger guidelines. A post a, a, a an industry with a post merger HHI of of 2,500 and an increase in the in the HHI of 200 was presumptively unlawful. In the new guidelines, they've re reduced these standards from 2,500 to 1,800 and from 200 to 100, and they've also proposed a uh, presumption of unlawfulness if the post-merger firm would have a 30% market share and an increase of 100 points in the Herfindahl-Hirschman index. Translating that into English, it means if you have a 28% share and a 2% increase from 28 to 30%, that's presumptively unlawful. At the same time, for non-horizontal mergers, they've uh, put in, again, a structural presumption that anytime you have a market share in an upstream or a downstream product or service of 50% or more, that's presumptively unlawful. And then in another one of the guidelines, uh, they say that all mergers that could entrench a dominant position are presumptively unlawful. And they define a dominant position as only 30%. Um, very, very rigorous. Uh, relying on case law that, that, that's been around for, for 50 years, but very different from where the enforcement philosophy has been uh, over the last uh, 40 years, really. Moving on to the next slide, um, here are the 13 guidelines that make it into, uh, uh, that make it into the, the draft merger guidelines. I'm gonna give you one sentence on each just to try to give you the flavor for what, what they're talking about. Um, the first one, that's the 28 plus two, or the the, uh, the HHI numbers that I that I just talked about. Uh, number two, uh, even without defining a market, if there's substantial competition between firms that will be lost, that's presumptively unlawful. Uh, number three, mergers should not increase the risk of coordination. That's similar to the coordinated interaction guidelines uh, the, under the current uh, horizontal merger guidelines, uh, but it's there. Uh, number four, mergers should not eliminate a potential entrant in a concentrated market. So doesn't really change the existing law. We're talking about both perceived potential entry and uh, actual potential competition. Um, again, can presumptively uh, violate the law. Uh, number five, um, this is this is addresses vertical merger concerns. Um, mergers should not substantially lessen competition by creating a firm that controls products or services that its rivals may use to compete. Uh, this is looking at both the potential for foreclosure or for discrimination in upstream or downstream products or services. Number six is very much related to number five, but uh, this is where the presumption is that if the foreclosure share is 50% or more, that's presumptively uh, unlawful. And uh, below 50%, you're still not out of the uh, in the clear. The agencies will look at various factors to determine whether the, the, the emerged firm will be in ability, will be in a position to foreclose competition. Uh, number seven, mergers should not entrench or extend a dominant position. Uh, here we define dominance, or the guidelines define dominance as the power to raise price, reduce quality, or having at least a 30% market share, which is very low. Uh, number eight, mergers should not further a trend towards concentration. So would the merger increase the pace of concentration? Um, for example, an HHI increase over uh, 200 points. Um, number nine, when a merger uh, is part of a series of multiple acquisitions, the agencies may examine the whole series. What they're going after here, I think, primarily is roll-ups by private equity firms. Uh, private equity firms may be rolling up industries uh, by a series of very small acquisitions. And here they take the position that even if the acquisition is below the Hartscott value or below or in, involves just a very small increase in market share, um, they can look at the whole series of acquisitions. Uh, number 10, when a merger involves a, a multi-sided uh, platform, the agencies examine competition between platforms, on a platform, or to displace a platform. So here they're looking at uh, acquisitions of nascent platforms or acquisitions of platform participants or service, pro service providers that can entrench dominance by preventing, uh, precluding others from having access to them. Um, number 11, when a merger involves competing buyers, the agencies uh, <clears throat> examine whether it may substantially lessen competition for workers or other sellers. So here we're looking at, at not only competition to sell products or services, but also competition uh, to hire people. Um, this has been a, a, uh, 
a central tenet of the FTC and DOJ. Um, number 12, uh, it, it relates to partial ownership or minority interests. And here, this is really not a change, but it sort of consolidates the thinking um, the concerns with partial acquisitions or minority interests are, will that minority interest give you the power to influence the competitive behavior of the target, or will having a partial ownership uh, uh, give the acquiring firm less incentive to compete vigorously, or will it give the acquiring firm access to confidential information, competitively sensitive information of the, of the minority interest? And, and finally, in case we left anything out of the list, uh, here's the catch-all provision. Uh, we, we shouldn't otherwise substantially less than computation or tend to create a monopoly. So there's an awful lot there, and uh, it is much more rigorous. So my key takeaways on the next slide. Um, so as I said, we're relying on older case law. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court hasn't issued a merger decision in more than 50 years. Where the new guidelines bring back uh, uh, ideas, concepts that have not really been part of the dialogue at the agencies for 40 years, but they will be now. As a result of relying on the case law rather than on the uh, <clears throat> more hard and fast economic-based rules that the more recent guidelines have, I think there's probably less clarity to the business community of where to draw the line. I think the FTC and DHA are fine with that. They like to have the chilling effect. Uh, they are very much uh, going back to the idea that bigness is badness. Um, so these really are statements of enforcement philosophy. They're not necessarily binding on the courts. Um, the courts, uh, you know, the FTC and DOJ cannot block a deal on their own. They need to go to court to convince the court that the deal is unlawful. Um, although the, the agencies are relying on Supreme Court case law from the 60s and 70s, uh, lots of lower court decisions have gone past where the Supreme Court was. Uh, we'll, it's an open question to see uh, to what extent the courts will be persuaded uh, it's an interesting time here in terms of uh, enforcement philosophy and merger control. So hopefully I got to your question, Fernando. Thank you, Michael. Certainly did. Uh, Leonardo, what do CAGI's guidelines look like and, and what are these proposed changes that we're seeing? Thank you, Fernanda. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to participate in this webinar with this terrific team from Steptoe and with my dear colleagues from Veirano. Well, uh, the novelty in Brazil in terms of guidelines and CAGI's toolkit for merger control enforcement is that CAGI submitted to public consultation a draft version of its non-horizontal merger guidelines that CAGI has been announcing for some time uh, to complement the successful and popular horizontal mergers guidelines, our dear H guide, as it is nicknamed, uh, uh, which has been in place since 2016. So these new guidelines have been nicknamed as the V plus guide and covers both vertical and conglomerate mergers. And there is no indication in the V plus guide or elsewhere that CAGI intends to change or amend its H guide to establish a more rigorous level of scrutiny in merger control in general. Uh, the, the H guide seems to be working uh, very well, both for CAGI and for the legal and business, and, and business communities. And the, it provides a clear and straightforward path with all steps of CAGI's competition assessment, including the definition of the relevant markets, horizontal overlaps, market shares, and the assessment of the likelihood of abuse of market power with the analysis of uh, levels of rivalry, entry conditions, imports, unilateral and coordinated effects, monopsony, power, and possible efficiency. So this is working very well, and uh, there is no sign that CAGI intends uh, to change th that. Now, uh, uh, in the next slide, uh, uh, if, if we can move to the next slide. Okay, and now the proposed, uh, uh, the proposed V guide comes to, to complement the H guide and to provide more detailed and structured uh, structured guidance for the assessment of vertical mergers and conglomerate mergers, focusing on the analysis of the capacity and incentives to produce anti-competitive effects that may result uh, from such transactions. Like the H guide, the V plus guide is intended to consolidate the best practices and procedures that have been adopted by CAGI uh, to assess uh, non-horizontal effects in merger cases, and, and to provide more transparency and clarity on what to expect 
from CADI in the assessment of vertical and conglomerate mergers. So uh, the V plus guide does not bring major changes nor indicate that CADI will adopt a higher level of scrutiny that could be considered a deviation from its consolidated case law regarding vertical and conglomerate mergers. The draft v, v plus guide that was submitted uh, to public consultation uh, is organized in four main topics. The possible vertical in, uh, and conglomerate integrations, procedures for the assessment of non-horizontal mergers with five stages of analysis, including uh, the definition of the relevant markets, market shares and concentration levels, possible risk to competition in upstream and downstream markets, benefits resulting from the transaction, and possible remedies. It also has a topic on possible anti-competitive effects in vertical integrations and possible anti-competitive effects that may result from conglomerate integrations. Um, the guide also addresses some potential safe harbors like vertical integrations with market shares below 30% in the affected uh, markets, situations of supply for captive consume, consumption, and pre-existing uh, verticalization. And the guideline also reinforces the importance of strong evidence, including documentary evidence, to demonstrate the, the rationality of the transaction in the context of a vertical integration of our conglomerate uh, integration. So uh, although the, the V plus guide does not indicate a major change in merger control enforcement in Brazil, it is obviously a sign that CAGI is aligned with the best practices in the international com uh, competition law community to keep a, a close eye on possible anti-competitive effects that may result from vertical and conglomerate mergers, particularly in digital markets and in multi-product digital uh, ecosystems. ecosystems. So, uh, this new guideline is a welcome initiative and will be a good addition to CAGI's merger control toolkit to increase transparency, legal certainty, and predictability for CAGI, CAGI's decision-making process in non-horizontal mer mergers. And during the, the public consultation, CAGI received some suggestions and contributions to improve the structure and the language of the V-Guide, particularly to restructure its format to have a more straightforward description of the steps of analysis to improve the definitions of some important concepts that were not uh, uh, very well detailed in the guide, like uh, portfolio power, network effects, and others, uh, and to include more references to CAD's precedents that based the guide uh, to better illustrate uh, how CAD has applied those concepts, concepts in practice in, in previous cases. So we, we look forward to seeing if and how Kaji will absorb these suggestions of improvement in the final version uh, of the V guide, of the V plus guide. And uh, a final note uh, in the next slide, please. Uh, Kaji has published uh, a working document prepared by its Department of Economic Studies together with Kaji's commissioner, Victor Fernandes on Theories of Harm and CAGES case law between 2012 and 2022 involving uh, conglomerate mergers. So this is a working paper that is, is a welcome addition to CAGES toolkit to better frame this uh, recent discussion to consolidate how CAGES has been assessing conglomerate mergers and even to provoke CAGES to refine and expand its assessment uh, and apply renewed theories and methodologies, particularly in cases involving digital markets and ecosystems and uh, dynamic conglomerate power. So uh, to conclude, although the, the new uh, V plus guide and the working paper on conglomerate mergers do not bring major changes or indicate a major shift to a higher level of scrutiny on merger control in Brazil, they are a very good additions to CAD's toolkit uh, for merger control enforcement, and they are a clear sign that CADI, uh, uh, Cla that CADI is very uh, that vertical and conglomerate mergers are on CADI's radar, and that CADI is attentive and well equipped to deal with the challenges that such transactions may raise, particularly in digital markets. Thank you, Leonardo. Now. Uh... I do realize there are some proposed changes to the hard carbon reporting guidelines. So, John, 
what types of additional reporting will be required in the US under this proposed gu guideline? You're on mute, Chang. Thank you, Fernanda, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for attending, and thank you to our friends at Verano for hosting. We appreciate the fact that they are conducting this in English rather than Portuguese. Uh, so the answer, Fernanda, to your question is that a lot of time and a lot of effort will be required by these uh, new proposed guidelines. The FTC estimates that an additional 222 hours of prep time will be required for filing, and this is likely low. So there will be tremendous added cost uh, and time and record keeping required. There's changes to the narrative responses, documents that need to be produced, and other information that's required to be provided to the government. In recent years, the government issued requests for additional information in around 2% of HSR filings and then took action, uh, to enforcement action, in less than 1% of those transactions. So what they're basically doing here is front-loading the additional information or much of it that was previously only required in second requests. So this didn't go over very well with the business community, uh, at least with uh, large businesses. The public comment period ended a few weeks ago. There were 720 comments. Large business, the large business community generally commented through industry organizations. And generally, the response was that the proposed requirements were burdensome, unnecessary, overreach, not consistent with the intent of the Hart-Scott-Rodino reporting requirements. And the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is the premier business association, stated simply that the proposed rules violate the law. So uh, there may be challenges uh, either before or after these take effect. And uh, but it's it, it's likely that the changes will go into effect early next year. You can go to the next slide, please. So uh, a little bit more detail about what's required. Uh, companies will be required to explain the rationale for their transactions, uh, provide information on uh, overlaps between the parties, top customers for each party apply relationships between the parties or with their competitors and provide a timeline and conditions for closing the transaction. Uh, a list of prior acquisitions in the past 10 years will also be required to be provided. That is along the lines of what Michael talked about, about uh, roll-up uh, transactions where a series of small transactions will lead to a large market share. Document production. Uh, all agreements and all parts of agreements, uh, the term sheet or detailed uh, draft agreement, a bare bones agreement is not enough anymore. Uh, deal analysis, including drafts, and that's a key change provided to directors, observers, and the deal team lead. Um, so the idea that not only the final, but drafts and things provided to more people than uh, was required in the past. Uh, plans and reports that are not prepared in connection with the transaction, and then org charts, so presumably they know who to uh, pose questions to. Um, other information, and there's a, a split here between information that's related to the transaction, information that's not necessarily related to the transaction, but has to do with the business, information that's antitrust focused, and then information that sort of goes beyond to uh, the interests of the Biden administration that's not necessarily related to antitrust, but other social uh, goals. Uh, other information includes information about officers and directors. Uh, there's a concern about interlocking directorates, so that information will be provided now. Uh, details about my, minority owners, uh, so these are both antitrust issues. And then expanding into the administration's concern about labor issues, employee classifications, and history of workplace violations and investigations. And then on the national security front, subsidies and contracts that the companies have with US defense and intelligence interests. Fernanda, if we could go to the next slide. 
okay, how to how to deal with these things. So for document production, planning is the key word. If you want to avoid scrambling at the end and avoiding having to produce bad documents, uh, planning now and keeping track of what you're doing uh, will go a long way towards avoiding problems when you have to provide documents to the government. Creating a review process where documents are screened before to avoid minefields uh, in the future, before these documents are handed off to people who trigger the requirement that the documents are provided to the government. Uh, and part of that would be reviewing document retention policies. Uh, make sure that your document retention policy doesn't get rid of what you need to produce but also make sure that your policy calls documents that don't necessarily have to be produced, but if you have them on hand at the time, uh, they would, be have to, would have to be turned over to the government. Uh, pay attention to uh, getting in place translations of non-English documents, um, and then training employees about antitrust issues. Um, this is something that could go towards preventing problems, uh, preventing the creation of bad documents. And as part of this, I mentioned labor issues and, and other things that may not traditionally come within the uh, realm of antitrust. Um, because you have to report on labor, um, the people in your human resources department uh, may have some documents and uh, they may have some bad documents. There's an interest in uh, poaching agreements between parties, anti-poaching agreements between parties. So uh, pay attention to um, training all the people who may have materials that the government is seeking. All right, I have to give off a out a code word uh, that you need for CLE uh, credit and our code word will be coffee for today. I forgot to give out my code word and I will do that uh, later. Keeping everyone in suspense. Good. That's right. All right. Uh, tips for addressing uh, information reporting requirements. Uh, mentioned labor information, uh, storing this information rather than having to dig for it or gather it at the time that there is an HSR filing. Um, basically, the bottom line with all these information requirements is keep it as you're going along, file it so that you have it. Uh, rather than having to go search for it. Keep a record of uh, what other companies, your officers and directors uh, are serving on their boards. Uh, keep track of your defense and intelligence contracts. Um, keep track of your non-US subsidies. This goes to the concern about, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that should be non-US subsidiaries. And uh, no, subsidies. It, should be, it should be subsidies. The concern here is a national security concern, right. but subsidies from, from foreign governments of, of interest. And that list is going to change over time, but uh, uh, but but it is, it is subsidies. It could also go to sub, uh, subsidies to subsidiaries. But the idea is keeping track of these things rather than having to dig for them at the time. And then also keep track of your messaging systems, your communication systems, and how you're going to access and gather information. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, tips, you're going to be providing the government with a lot of information. Uh, know what you have. So the idea is, you know, be aware of, you know, if you have potential interlocks between your directors and directors at another company, obviously be aware of any agreements you have with horizontal competitors and, you know, continually monitor these things so that when you do have to predict produce this tremendous load of information and documents for a merger uh, that you have uh, awareness of these things and you have acted to prevent problems. So thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, now, if we compare this to Brazil, Alberto, how do US reporting requirements compare to those in Brazil? Yeah, th thanks, Fernanda, for, for the question. Thanks, everyone, for uh, participating with us. That's a good good point. So we, we put there this, this slide with this with this comparison. And of course, it's a illustrative exercise only. So we will compare the, the information, the, re the requirements of information and materials demanded by the, the, the new uh, U.S. Filing form as proposed by the new guidelines, 
and compare this with CAD's uh, ordinary filing form, which is applicable for transactions not eligible for fresh to fresh track proceeding. So the comparison, of course, is not perfect because even when both forms require the same information, they may require different aspects of the same information or different levels of detail on, on the on the on the information. But anyway, the it's a we we believe it's an interesting exercise that may even suggest to us, based on what we see in the slide, that the the, the standard uh, requirements in the US right now appear to be uh, more rigorous and, and require more information and documents than the, 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 the requirements applicable to the more complex uh, transactions in, in Brazil. So I can go uh, fast point by point just to, to illustrate uh, so on, on narrative responses and competitive information, here we have a lot of overlap. So strategic rationale for the transaction is something that uh, our filing form in Brazil already requires, even the fast track one. Uh, and ordinary form, the longer form, requires even information on internal documents uh, presented to the board or other, or other control instances. Uh, evidencing the rationale for, for the transaction. Uh, in terms of hor horizontal overlaps and top uh, clients, also required by Brazilian longer filing form, uh, uh, overlaps even in the fast track uh, form, it, it's required, and, and top clients uh, in, the, in our longer form. So supply relationship between the parties and, and with competitors is also is something that also is required in the Brazilian uh, filing form. So especially the relationship, uh, supply and other kinds of vertical relationship between the parties and their groups. And in the case of the ordinary filing form, it also requires information on, on main suppliers in the relevant markets affected. So it's something that... Uh, Brazil also, also wants parties to, to present. Timeline and conditions for closing, uh, maybe in a different format, but the Brazilian filing form also uh, requires information on, on corporate aspects of the transaction. And regarding prior acquisitions, yes, uh, the, our filing form require parties to present prior acquisitions in the last five years. I understand in the US, it's supposed to be a little longer, but we, we'll get there. Uh, in terms of document production, I understand that the, U, the US uh, parties will need to present now all agreements, including the, the, the schedules and, and appendices. In the case of our longer form in Brazil, CAGI does require copies of all transaction documents, including shareholder agreements and no, or no compete agreements if they exist. Uh, and also including, as we said, internal reports or studies presented to the board or other relevant instances at the company regarding the transaction. But just a, a small detail for Brazil, unless CAGI makes a, a specific requirement during the review, parties do not need to present necessarily all the annexes to the main agreements. They can simply list them by name and CAGI will require them if see need for that. Uh, the next point, the term sheet of that draft agreement with sufficient detail and, and, and meaning that uh, the bare bones LOI will no, lo no longer suffice. This is uh, more or less in line with, with Brazilian requirements as well. Prior agreements between the parties, uh, not necessarily something that parties in Brazil need to submit. CAD may ask for that, but it's not a default request by our, by our form. Uh, deal analysis, including drafts provided to directors, observers, deal teams, so on. Uh, again, in the case of our longer form, this is something that is required. CAD may waive uh, some of, of that uh, during the pre-filing phase, but in theory, this is something that is required. And as we could see from Leonardo's uh, presentation, now invert according to the, the V plus guidelines, is something that Kaji uh, will tend to, to demand in, in vertical mergers as well. 
So periodic plans, reports, not prepared in connection with the transaction and organization charts, not something that, that is, is demanded by, by CAD in, in, the, in the notification form. CAD demands uh, charts of the economic group, the companies of the same group, not necessarily the corporate charts of the, the main uh, executives. And finally, on other information uh, requirements, this is perhaps the section where the, 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 the new uh, US uh, requirements are even broader than, than more extensively broader than the Brazilian requirements. So again, there is no need to present detailed information on officer, director, board, board observers, but CAG does require that if that you present, that the parties present, uh, board members or, or other members of control uh, divisions who are members of the, the, the boards or, 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 or the, the, the control divisions of other players in the same market. So you just need to present information if this situation exists. If not, no need to present information on, 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 on directors and so on. Uh, minority owners and others, also it's something that Kaji tends to require in the filing forms because it, it does require you to present information on the economic groups involved, including the, the shareholders with, with some control power, even if they are not the, the majority controller. And then we, we have here a couple of, of categories on employees uh, that's something we are gonna I'm going to say a little bit more about that soon but the our filing form does not require information on that and also subsidies from foreign uh, entities and, and governments of concern US defense or intelligent contracts and all prior acquisitions in the past 10 years by all parties none of that is required with the exception of as I mentioned prior acquisitions our filing form requires that parties present prior acquisitions in the last five years. So moving to the, the, to the next slide, the, the, the comment that I that I was going to, to make on, on labor issues, uh, the overlap of labor issues and antitrust, I see that based on what I learned from our friends at Stato today, uh, the DOJ and the FTC are more interested in having labor impacts information now than, than, than before. And, and in the case of Brazil, CAG and our authorities have been showing also uh, more interest in, in labor impacts. So I have two, two notes on, on that. First, and two, a couple of years ago, uh, CAG started an investigation in the labor market involving healthcare companies. Uh, I'm sure most of the those here remember or heard of that. Uh, it's not a merger review scenario. It's an investigation of, of a alleged cartel type violation, exchange of sensitive information. Uh, so the, between those companies about labor aspects, so Kaji showed interest and has been showing uh, interest in labor impacts, labor impacts recently. But uh, a little bit on, on, on going towards the other direction, we had a, also a, a recent, a couple of months ago, a recent decision by a high labor court in Brazil, a judicial court uh, in a public uh, civil action, demanding CAD, uh, our prosecutors, uh, labor prosecutors filed this action, but demanding CAD to take into account labor aspects uh, when doing merger review, more or less, uh, in the same uh, aligned with what uh, may happen in, in, in the US, in the US now. Uh, and, and our high court, TRT, uh, uh, granted this, this request, meaning that uh, according to the decision, CAD now has to uh, take into account labor aspects in merger review and also inform the unions, the, the relevant unions impacted about the, 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 the merger review to, to so they can present comments if they see fit. Uh, but Kaji here is not in agreement with that position in this lawsuit, which is ongoing. Kaji is expected and it's likely to, to appeal if, if it has, has not done it yet. And, and uh, as an institutional position, Kaji does not want to be required to take into account 
labor aspects when doing merger review. So uh, somewhat different approach than, than the, the regulators in, in the US, the US right now. So yes, I'll, I'll pause here and, and give it back to, to, to Fernanda and the group to see if we have more, more questions or, or notes. Right. Thank Fernanda, you. before you take the mic here, let me just say yeah. the second super secret password, which is sugarcane. The password is sugarcane. Thanks. Thank you, Lee, and thank you, Alberto. I want to thank every one of our speakers. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes for questions, if anyone has them. Well, while we're waiting for a question, um, just just one comment on <clears throat> what Alberto and, and, and John were talking about. I mean, so it was an excellent comparison, Alberto. <clears throat> I <clears throat> note that you compared the new Hart-Scott form against the, the standard, uh, the long form that the CACHA requires. Uh, in the US, there is no, at this point, short form or fast track procedure nor is there any any established um, process of pre-notification. So while you can talk to KJ or you can talk to the European Commission about lessening the burdens, we don't have that in the, in the states as of yet. So it's going to be very interesting to see how a lot of this plays out. That was one of the suggestions by some of the business associations, like, all right, uh, can we have a shortcut form? And they suggested that that would be one of the changes to the proposed rules. I'm very and it, works, yeah. and it works really well here in Brazil. The, the, the difference between the short planning questionnaire and the long form uh, it has been working for a very long time within CAG. It was a very good practice that they adopted a long time ago, establishing this fast track procedure. As we saw, 90% of the transactions are approved under this fast track procedure. The authority does not need to have the access to all of those information uh, to, to, to review a, a transaction that has no impact. So it has been working great here in Brazil, this, this distinction. And uh, Kaji, the, 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 the pre-finding pre uh, procedure, discussing with Kaji and Kaji requesting additional information works also really well. And uh, just, just to, to highlight, the, the comparison that Alberto did is from the get-go. The long-form questionnaire compared to all of the, 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 the requirements in the U.S. So there, there's not much of that much of a difference, but we are talking about only, as John mentioned, only complex cases that we need to provide, provide all of the all of that. For the majority of cases, it's much simpler. What's frustrating about this is that when I worked at the DOJ, a merger came in the door with, a, with the old HSR form, and it was I quickly divided up into two work streams. One were the very easy cases that would probably be subject to a short form in Brazil, which went to a paralegal. And the paralegal just gave it a quick look, filled out a form, and it was good to go. I uh, even so so the, the DOJ and FTC have the ability to do that that split, and yet um, they're going to require um, such a burdensome uh, production for all uh, for all deals. And you know, DOJ and FTC, probably symptomatic of the U.S. government in general, is really terrible at learning best practices from other countries. Uh, so I don't expect there to be a short form adopted anytime soon in the U.S. There also has been discussions, Lee. It's interesting to mention in CAD is to expedite even more the procedure of adopting uh, automated, uh, automated uh, finding forms. We already had some automated uh, requests for information. Kaji sends the request for information with a link, and the company enters into that link. And there's like uh, there's some alternatives to, to 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 respond. Much it, it makes it much quicker to provide information to Kaji if Kaji wants it. So there there has been even these discussions to further expedite uh, Kaji's assessment. Yes, and, and not to brag about it and not, and not to cause any type of envy on you, on our U.S. colleagues. Uh, even in the more complex cases that require the long form, Kaji has been very amenable uh, to, to waive some information that uh, we can demonstrate and explain that's not necessary for the competition assessment or that it would be very difficult to obtain. Uh, so if Kaji considered that this would not be uh, indispensable. So Kaji has been very flexible and amenable to waive uh, part of this information during the pre-filing context. Yeah, I don't... 
the way these proposed rules are written, it, it seems like uh, the U.S. government does not care and that they want all this information and they will then choose to see uh, how they want to use it. Well, I think it's fair to say that the U.S. agencies are, are sort of uh, jealous of the amount of information that they see the European Commission getting in a form CO or Kaiji getting in a long form. And, and gee, these other agencies get this information. Why shouldn't we get it, too? Um, and the answer is because we there are no shortcuts uh, under the system. Uh, and um, you know, one of the big changes is the requirement to file all drafts of documents. Um, gee, they may be overwhelmed with the amount of information that, that's being submitted. It may not solve the problem, it may cause a worse problem in terms of, of just the volume of information that being required will be required to sift through to make a, a decision in, in uh, under the statutory timeframes. Very but, little thought has gone into uh, how this how the staff at DOJ and FTC could actually review all this document, all these documents and all this information in the very short time frame that they have under the HSR statute, 30 days. That 30 days is not a month. That 30 days is actually more like a week because there are all kinds of other internal processes that have to happen once a single staff member looks through all this stuff. It was a challenge in my experience to get uh, all the merger, the, all the initial screenings done for the merger review with the information that we had received under the old form, I, I, it is inconceivable to me that most of this information is going to get looked at uh, during that initial screening process. And if it's not going to get looked at, what's the point of putting the burden on people to freeze? I, I do have a quick question before we, we end. Uh, do you expect with these changes, do you expect that the FTC and DOJ in the US and CAD in Brazil will become more rigorous in the assessment of MA transactions in digital markets? Your answer is yes. Yeah, I think in Brazil uh, and all over the world, uh, digital markets have been a, a big target for antitrust authorities, be it in merger control, be it in investigation of. Uh, uh, and a combative conducts in Kaji, we already had the creation of specific unit aimed at investigating unilateral conducts, and it has been increasing significantly the amount of invest investigations, especially about, against uh, digital players, and in merger control as well. Uh, in, in fact, in Kaji, uh, in Brazil, we do have a mechanism that Kaji may request to review transactions, even though they are not, they do not comply. With the finding thresholds, so uh, we may see the use of this uh, tool more uh, to investigate uh, mergers in the digital market, in which a dominant player buys, uh, uh, enters into a killer acquisition, for instance. So I think yes, as well. Yeah, I think you know, really the, the, the proposed guidelines are really a reflection of the increased attention on digital markets, which are, is already evident from the cases against. Uh, Google and, and, and Facebook and, and Amazon, the investigations of Apple. So uh, you know, yes, it, you know, the brief answer was yes, and, and that's, that's where we are. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank our speakers again. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Have you. a nice day. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have bye a good bye. one. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.